so that we can send this out afterwards. Professor Rosenberry, if you wouldn't mind just um, continuing to admit people in. As Absolutely. I'm getting, kicking us off. Sure. So thank you all for joining this presentation, this workshop, lever leveraging interactive tools in Zoom to keep students engaged. My name is Danny Shapiro, and I'm on the marketing team here at Hawks Learning. Our speaker today is Leah Rosenberry of Penn State University. Professor Rosenberry is an IT training specialist and Penn State's lead Zoom trainer. She was instrumental in the university's move to remote teaching for COVID-19 and is continuing to support faculty and staff in using Zoom effectively so that virtual classes and meetings are viable and sometimes even superior alternative to face-to-face. -face. Prior to working at Penn State, Professor Rosenberry taught college level math and statistics for 20 years in face-to-face -face, hybrid and online formats. With over 16 years in online education, he has experience in curriculum development, creating online content, training and mentoring new instructors, and writing and facilitating online courses. So we are so excited to have you here, Professor Rosenberry. We had you for a, a several different sessions over the course of this spring, and they have all been really well received. I can't wait to share another new topic um, that you have to present. So Great. Be prepared for an interactive session tonight. And on that note, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you so very much. I appreciate everything. Hold on one second. I am going to make sure I'm sharing my screen there. There. Can you see my screen again? Uh, yes. Okay, great. I am uh, just going to say hello and everything like that. Thank you for the kind introduction. Welcome, everybody. Um, buckle your seatbelts is all I have to say. Oh, sorry, Jan. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm trying to figure out if the problem is on my end or on Jan's end. Um, I can hear you okay. Can you hear me? I can. Good deal. But you I sound great. Hear, I'm sorry. Who was speaking before you? Uh, Dan. Yeah, Hawks was. Yeah. Yeah, it was really low. Was oh, okay. I, okay. All right. Well, guess what? I, I think it's me from now on, so we're good. <laughs> but thank you, everybody, again for coming. Um, we're going to learn about interaction in Zoom today. So hopefully that is a uh, – so you'll learn some things. No matter – I don't care how experienced you are with Zoom – you'll hear some things maybe you haven't heard before, maybe seen uh, before used in a different way and things like that. So it is going to be um, a, a good thing, I think. And I hope you guys will share with me also. Um, so many people are Zoom experts, whether they wanted to be or not, uh, based on everything we had to do over spring. So here we are. But as far as um, just kind of setting things up for the session, please participate. We're going to be doing some hands-on type stuff. Um, and so I would love it for you guys to chime in and, you know, share and do whatever. Um, you can please keep your microphones muted. Um, if you do have a question to ask, go ahead and put that in chat. Um, if we have time if, as the session goes along, um, what I can do is I can, um, then I can allow you to open your mic or whatever. But for right now, let's try to stick with chat. I'm going to have you use the nonverbal feedback icons. So um, if you're not sure what that is, at the bottom of the participant window, you will see um, some little uh, icons here. There's a yes, there's a no. On your end, I believe you have a... Um, a, a th or not a thumbs up, a hand, a, he a, ra a hand raise, and things like that. So if you could use these, I'll be asking you throughout the session. If you don't have those available, what I can do is I can show you afterwards how to turn those on to make sure that they're available. I use those all the time when I'm teaching, whether it's a class like this or whether it's um, students. And so it's just a quick way to get some fast feedback. And so I love those. Um, and then, like I said, just use the chat. Um, there are going to be lots of people here tonight. I'll try and hit every question. I will go back um, through at the end, and if I missed any questions, we'll do a follow-up. And so I'll make sure I hit all your questions, even if I don't see it as we're going through. All right. I guess it's that time. I told you, buckle your seatbelts, because this is going to be fast. 
So we are going to um, talk about Zoom tonight. So these are our objectives. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, and hopefully you'll be able to, you're going to learn how to manage students to promote learning during virtual class meetings. Um, you're going to learn to deal with some common tech issues that you might have during your classes. Um, you're going to use Zoom tools to promote interaction and keep students engaged. And then finally, we're going to talk about best practices for each of the things that I show you, um, which is things like screen sharing, chat, um, the, those nonverbal feedback icons, and then also polling. So we're going to go through and do those. Now, what, do, what, what are the kind of the, the big things? So these are the big things. We're going to learn how to manage students. We're going to learn how to deal with common tech issues. We're going to keep students engaged, which is huge, in my opinion. If they're not engaged, there's no chance of them learning anything, right? I mean, if they're not listening to begin with, nothing else can happen. Um, and then again, like I said, we'll, we'll mostly focus on screen sharing, chat, nonverbal feedback, and then polling as well. So just to kind of set the mood and things like that, I have this poor, um, oopsie, too far. I have this poor... I have a little bit of a delay. There we go. I have this poor girl. She's ready to bite her pencil in half, and she's like, I just can't pay attention. What types of things do you think happen in online classes that make, make it difficult for people to, um, to pay attention? And it doesn't have to be class-based, right? It can be the things that are going on around them. I have two dogs. Every once in a while, a dog will walk up and want me to pet them or something like that. So what are the types of things? Crying kids, perfect. Using their cell phones, multitasking, monotone. You got that for sure. We're going to actually talk about that uh, this afternoon a little bit. They're tired. They're hungry. They're worried about time management. Amazon deliveries is hilarious. The Amazon deliveries and the dog kind of go together sometimes because whenever the Amazon delivery comes, the dog barks, and so that'll, uh, that'll do it. Stress and anxiety, boredom, the TV, you, it's all of these things, right? And so I, I will sometimes sign up to take a class, right, or do a workshop online or something like that, and it'll be something that I want to do. Like, I want to be there. I know I want to be there. I chose to be there. And even I get distracted. So it's important to remember that sometimes students are taking, <laughs> I, w I wish Amazon could deliver a dog. Sometimes their students are taking classes that maybe is not their favorite. I, I think I get a lot of that in math. I don't know about you guys. They feel like they have to or, uh, um, you know, they just need it for their major and all those other things that they say about, um, you know, different different subjects. But um, the good news is we're going to learn some stuff today, tonight, that is going to help you keep them engaged. And so they just need a little help, right? They just need a little help kind of being drawn back in when they start to drift off. And so that's what we're going to look at. All right, so these Zoom tools. Zoom tools are kind of um, split up, or uh, I feel like they can be split up into two different things, interaction and then collaboration. Interaction is what we're talking about tonight. Um, interaction is for more of the lower level kind of baseline knowledge and things like that. Um, if, if we're talking about blooms to go along with that, it's lower on the blooms um, bloom scale there. It might be remembering and understanding and listing and kind of those kind of, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that, lower level things. Whereas um, as we get into collaboration, that would be more like applying or analyzing, creating those, those things that <laughs> Jen said just got uh, distracted, so I totally get it. Um, and so those are more collaborative. This week, we're talking about interaction. Next week, if you signed up for that, I hope you did, we're going to talk about collaboration. And so between the two of those, you're going to have a whole toolbox that you can use um, with students. And I mean, we're here to talk about students and things like that, but you can use these strategies in any meetings that you have, right? And so it really um, helps to kind of. Um, um, keep things rolling and kind of think, you know, keep things um, interesting and, and stuff when we're all on Zoom um, all these hours every day. So this is kind of what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about some basic interaction skills first. We're going to talk about using a microphone and sharing your screen.
Then we're going to get into some more intermediate stuff, uh, checking for attention using nonverbal feedback icons. And I did see a comment that said somebody said they usually have them, but they don't tonight. That can happen. Um, what you want to do is make sure you're always signed into your Zoom account and that you have them turned on in your account and they should be there. Um, but I can help you troubleshoot that if you need it. Um, so those nonverbal feedback icons and chat, and then also for checking for understanding, we can use chat and polls. So we'll, we'll be talking about all of those things tonight. After that, we're going to get into, and this is the part for next week, the collaboration part. We're going to talk about chat and private chat can be used for collaboration. Um, we can talk about how to use whiteboards um, or uh, annotations to um, collaborate and then also breakout rooms, which is another um, kind of exciting thing to do. Um, I don't know about you, but when I teach, I use a lot of, uh, when I teach face to face, I use a lot of small groups and things like that. You can replicate those things in Zoom using big breakout rooms. Um, and even though you can't like look across the room and kind of see how a group is doing, you can go and float through the rooms and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a pretty decent alternative. So we can look at those. But again, what we're gonna do tonight, interaction, and so we're gonna actually start with your microphone. It might seem like a small thing, but it's really a big thing. It, it, and luckily, let's put it this way, it's a small thing that can have a big impact, which is really good. Um, audio quality is definitely important. Um, I actually was on a meeting at two o'clock this afternoon, so sort of, you know, pretty much right before this, and um, one of the speakers, he actually had to be, was the one um, leading the meeting. He kept, it, it kept garbling up. His, his, uh, his sound kept garbling up. It just didn't sound right, and it was aggravating to everybody in the meeting, not because, not because, like, we're, I, aggravate is probably not the right word, but it interferes with being able to understand whenever you can't hear it clearly and things like that. So um, it made a huge difference. So what actually fixed it and what I was going to do tonight is I was going to have us turn off our cameras, but it seems like it might be working okay. So we'll stick with it as long as it was. What we had, we asked him to do, um, luckily I was in a room with a bunch of techies. They told him to turn off his camera fix the voice issue right like that, fix the sound issue, which I would not have believed that it would, that would, it would be that easy to fix it, but it totally did. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. If you have a bunch of people, it's a good idea to turn off video to preserve bandwidth. And I saw, yes, there's a question about um, turning off uh, the sound for everybody. And when we, I'll, I'll get to that in just a few slides and I'll show you exactly how to do that. You can, you can turn off the sound for one person um, at a time, or you can turn it off for everybody at the same time. And so I'll show you the differences in those just shortly. So you wanna use a good mic or a USB headset with a mic. Um, USB headsets like the one I have right here, uh, pretty, um, pretty inexpensive. They really are, they're not too bad at all. Um, they are between, I'd say 25 and $30, and they do make a huge difference. Even though I'm in a room, um, I don't really get that much of an echo just because of the way the 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 microphone, um, I think this is called the boom, comes across like this. Um, and so that's something to think about depending on how your sound is. Your sound might be fine, but you can just check it that way. Um, you want to be proficient with the technology. And this is kind of a little thing where the more you know, the better you feel. If you learn about some common sound issues, it'll be easy for you to help your students who might be having a sound issue, and then it'll just make you be feel better about the whole thing. Somebody talked about an echo. That's actually my next couple of slides. We're gonna talk about echoes and how to fix them, and so we'll do that. And then Becky said, wouldn't limiting cameras decrease interaction and engagement? You're absolutely right, and so you have to kind of um, balance that out. You have to decide, okay, if, if it's really interfering, right, they're not gonna learn anyway because they might not be able to hear you properly or something like that. So in that case, it might be a good idea, even though we would love to keep them all on, to go ahead and just turn off cameras. Um, maybe you could have a thing where um, just like people turn their microphones on and off when they're speaking, maybe you would have people turn their 
um, cameras on and off when they're speaking, sort of along those same lines. So just something to think about. Best case scenario, everybody has their camera on and, and everybody can see each other and, and it's, uh, and it's um, much more personal that way. You're exactly right, Becky. Um, yeah, and so that is kind of the deal with this um, as far as like managing audio and things like that. You will want to, when you get in Zoom, Every single time, not kidding, you want to check your sound and audio. And so right here, whenever I, um, on the bottom left-hand side of your screen, you'll see a mute, unmute button. And on that button is sort of this little up arrow sort of right beside it. If you click that up arrow, you'll see that you have sort of three sections there. The top section is your microphone. The middle section is your speaker. And then the bottom section is some just sort of things you can, you can um, some settings and things like that. I wanna draw your attention to testing speaker and microphone. You should test your speaker and microphone whenever you go into a meeting, um, almost, well, especially if you're teaching, just almost every time. Uh, once you do it and you're set up correctly, Zoom is really good at remembering your connection and setting it up the same way the next time. It used to be with cameras and microphones that everybody just sort, I'm sorry, speakers and microphones, everybody just had, this is way back in the day, you just had one option, right? It would just be like, you would just have your computer sound or whatever. But you'll notice here, I have a headset, I have my built-in microphone, I have my uh, microphone that goes along with my video camera. So there's lots of, you know, usually people have multiple options. And so what this test speaker and microphone does is it just takes you through. It'll play a sound and you'll, you'll mark yes or no whether you hear the sound. So if I have a headset on, I wanna make sure that the sound is coming through the headset and not coming through my computer speakers or, and so forth. I do the same thing with a microphone. And then once I've done those two things, then I know that I'm good, I, type, I click yes, and then I'm good to go. We don't have time to do that right now. And so please make a little note to yourself to do that afterwards, just to test it. Um, and I'll share my email address. If you have any questions, I'm not even kidding. You can shoot me an email and I'll help you figure that out if you're having any problems. So you always wanna, like I said, always wanna make sure your sound is set up the way it's supposed to be. All right, next, we need to talk about the sound for the students that we have or the participants of our meeting. So the participants panel, this one only has one person on it, but the participants panel that I was showing you over here, we have lots of people in here. If I hover over just one person at a time, you can see that I can ask them to unmute or if somebody's, un if somebody's muted, then it, or I'm sorry, unmuted, then it would to be to mute them. And so that's how I do one person at a, at a time is just by hovering over them. If I wanna do everybody, it's right down here, mute all. And I'm just gonna go ahead and click this even though it won't mute you guys. When you click mute all, you get a pop-up, let me drag it over, that says mute all current and new participants. And then it gives me a checkbox. And the checkbox says allow participants to unmute themselves. So if I'm having trouble with a group not being quiet when they're supposed to, I could click um, to mute them all, and then I could unclick this, and then that would not let them unmute, right? So that would keep them quiet permanently until I unmuted them again, okay? If you feel like it's just somebody, you know, who, you know, mistakenly opened their mic or forgot to close it or something like that, then you're just going to check that box, and then you'll just say yes. That'll keep everybody muted, but they will be able to unmute themselves if they do need to talk. Um, a lot of times whenever people sign into a meeting, for example, they might forget that their mic is open and so they might be finishing up a phone call or something like that. And so we wanna save, um, save people from being embarrassed if they don't know they're unmuted. And so that is one way that you can do that. And so again, we have this mute all at the bottom. So again, one person, I do it up by hovering over their name. Everybody, I use one of the buttons at the bottom, okay? All right, um, as far as best practices for communication, decide how you want your students to communicate. Do you want them to use their mics or do you want them to uh, use the chat instead? 
if they are going to use their mics, do you want them to raise their hand first? And so it's sort of a, you know, you decide how you want to do it ahead of time. Um, and then we'll figure out how to, com how to communicate that to students. If it's an upper level class, right, and you know the students that you can, it's a smaller class, you can trust them, you've worked with them, they're familiar with you, you might be able to trust them a little more than maybe the first day of class when people don't even know how to use Zoom and things like that. So just something to keep in mind there. So again, make that strategy in advance. Then create those ground rules. Remember the very first slide and then that second slide where I had session guidelines. I just took a couple of minutes to kind of go over what, you know, how we would be interacting. Um, and so you could do that with your students as well. It makes a big difference letting them know exactly what to expect. I think most of the time students want to do what we want them to do. We just have to make sure we tell them what that is. So. Um, and again, review the guidelines with the participants. It's completely okay to re repeat instructions over and over again. Maybe remind them at the beginning of each session, something like that. And then somebody mentioned monotone. So this is uh, kind of like a check your voice type of thing. So as far as your tone goes, you want to be friendly and personable. That doesn't mean you have to be bubbly or talk a certain way or anything like that. It's just you want to make sure that students know that they can approach you. Um, as far as pitch goes, right, you want to use your whole range of your voice. You don't want to just be um, like uh, somebody mentioned, you don't want to be monotone um, or, um, um, you know, want to keep it interesting. Let's let's put it like that. As far as volume goes, you don't want to be too loud or too soft, although I will tell you that um, kind of varying the soft and the loud a little bit here and there makes a difference. It's another engagement strategy to um, sort of uh, stop talking for a second and maybe saying something in a lower voice because that difference in the hearing that difference in what they're hearing can sometimes draw students back in. So that's a good thing. And then the last one is uh, the rate. And so you don't want to be too fast. You don't want to be too slow. When I ask people which one of these is their uh, kind of um, uh, the one that they're most worry worried about, most of the time it's the rate. And so most of the time it's people worrying about either talking too fast or talking too slow. So those are just things to kind of keep in mind as you go through. Um, I am going to, uh, let me know, well, okay, let's do it this way. Um, give me a green check. So in that participant panel, give me a green check if you're good to go. Um, and give me a red X if you have any questions about voice or sound or anything like that. And I can help you with that. You guys are fast. Those are coming in quick. Good job. I love the nonverbal feedback icons to just kind of make sure students are with me as I go along. Um, so I appreciate that. All right. If you have a question, I don't see any red X's yet. If you have a question, just go ahead and type it in chat and I'll try and um, come back to that. Um, and so uh, we're going to move on from there. So the next thing is about sharing your screen. You might have shared your screen before. Um, there's some kind of, uh, not hidden secrets, but there's some things that people don't know about their sharing their screen. So usually when I do this part, every, a couple people have some aha moments, which I love. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So to share your screen, um, there's going to be the green share screen button at the bottom of your Zoom window. When you click that, you will get a menu, you could call it, of options. And it will show you all of the options that you have for sharing. The top row are all device-based items. So you can see right here, I have my whole desktop. Over here, I have a second desktop, because I have two monitors. Here, I have a whiteboard. And then here, I have my iPhone or iPad that I could share. The second row and beyond are all application-based things I could share, right? So up here, I'm going to share my whole monitor, but right here, I would only be sharing my, um, that looks like a PowerPoint to me, but it doesn't say PowerPoint. I'm going to assume it's a PowerPoint. Here, I would share my 
um, my PowerPoint. Or here I would share Snagit, or here I would share Teams, okay? So the difference between them is if I share my whole desktop, no matter what I drag onto the desktop, somebody will be able to see it. If I share just my PowerPoint and I drag something in front of it that's not PowerPoint, nobody will be able to see that. So here's an example. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna choose my monitor up here. If I share that and I wanna show you something else like my little participants panel here, even if I dragged it over in front of there, you would not be able to see that. So that's the difference between those two. Now, the um, couple things to think about. If you only have one monitor, then you might not want to share your whole desktop because it doesn't give you any room to kind of like move things around and do things the way that you want to. So that's something to think about with there. In that case, you might just want to share an application. Usually when I'm doing a session or teaching a class, I'll be sharing a PowerPoint and I might wanna show my calculator and I also might show something on the web. And so because of that, I might wanna make sure that I share a whole desktop um, instead of just one application. Um, Dina, I'm actually gonna show you that in just a second, kind of how those nonverbal feedback icons work. Yeah, no problem. Okay, the other thing you wanna do after you choose what you want to share, if you're going to be um, sharing anything that has sound. So if I'm gonna show a video clip and I want the sound to come through, I'm gonna click the share computer sound button down here. If I'm showing a video clip, I also wanna do the optimized um, screen share for video clip. Have you ever been in a meeting or anything like that where somebody shows uh, something on their computer, maybe a film, like a video clip or something, and you, you, you can tell the sound's not coming through, like you're picking it up through the microphone? It always sounds terrible when, when it do it that way because it's like coming through twice. But if I click this, Zoom will pick up the sound right from my computer, and then that way um, it will sound just as good on the Zoom call as it does to me whenever I'm watching it in person. Um, so keep those two um, things in mind whenever you're sharing your screen, if you're gonna do anything that you need to share sound for. Um, oops, sorry, you can't see these buttons here. If you click escape, it should make it a little bit smaller, Marion. That might work. Yeah. Okay, so some people can see them. Okay, perfect. Yeah, if you click escape, that should help, but just in case. Yes. Okay, so Becky said if I click those buttons, can you still hear everything? Yeah, what that does is if I click those two buttons so that I can share the computer sound, they'll still hear me, I'll still hear them. It's just you have that extra kind of sound input that goes from the computer to the participants. So yeah, it, it works just fine. The only problem I will say this is if you share computer sound, it also means that every time you get an email or a notification, they're gonna hear that too. So that would be the drawback. So make sure you turn all those other things off if you're gonna be sharing your computer sound. So something to think about with that. So after I make all my choices, I'm gonna click that share button. Once you share, your menu kind of detaches from the bottom and floats up to the top and sort of looks something like this. Here's my menu, now it's floating up here. Now, this is just a screenshot that I did so that you could see it later. Here's my actual menu. I'm gonna drag it over here so you can see it. This is my actual floating menu. This is just a screenshot right here. And so you can see, do I want a new share? Do I wanna pause my share? Um, I can annotate, I can um, use remote control. And then I have this more button. I show you this more button because if there's ever a button that you're looking for in Zoom that you can't find, don't panic. It's probably under more. And here's what happens. Let me move this one. And let me drag this one across. So this is my Zoom window. And if I open this, see the more button? See, I have screen share and then I have more. If I open this a little bit, watch. Now I have reactions. And now I have polls popping out. And so Zoom does me a favor 
and condenses things to fit my nice window. So again, when you can't see something, just remember to look under more. Yeah, I promise it'll be there, okay? All right. Putting that back over there. All right. Um, so that's about screen sharing. Um, when I open up a session, I always open up my participants panel and the chat, just like I told you to today. I, I always do that first. I'm always set up before I start teaching or whatever. If you don't do that, I don't know why that's there. If you don't do that ahead of time, you can still open chat from your menu. Just click the chat button up here. Again, I can open that more button. I can click chat. I can record. I can do breakout rooms, whatever I need, whatever it is I need to do, I can do from here also. All right. So now listen, so one thing uh, that kind of is, um, one thing you might be doing as you teach is doing some sort of online demo, right? That might be something with a website, or it could be you solving a problem, right? Writing on the screen and actually solving a problem. Um, it could be, you know, going on some sort of field trip, uh, you know, to a museum website or something like that. Um, I'm not sure what you mean about only um, share screen has more option. What does, give me a little bit more information and I can think I can, I think I can help. I bet I can help. But what you can do is you can actually do a couple of things. One of the things is we can, oopsie. There you go. <laughs> Cleared, Angela, thank you. So one of the things we can do is we can have one of our students um, actually do the demo for us. So we could have, so if a student has a question about, I don't know where to find something in Canvas or in Blackboard or whatever it is, and I could, I could have a student, or if they say, I can't find you know something or whatever, I could actually use this remote control button and have a student take control of my um, of my screen and I I'm allowing them to click around but I still have full control so don't worry about that but I can just let them click around in my class to show how to get them um, get there and things like that I'll show you that in just one second um, Angela and Brad um, and so that's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is you could have your students actually do a screen share. So you could let them share their screens and present something. Um, maybe you'll have group projects. And so maybe you'll have different groups uh, presenting or something like that. You could allow your students to share their screen. And then another thing to do is if you have somebody that you work with, maybe a TA or maybe um, you know, a co-teacher, whatever it is, you could actually have them and kind of trade back and forth between you and the other person um, to uh, do some demonstrations and things. Anything like that that we do that sort of um, changes things, whether it's trading off speakers or things like that, every single one of those little, little actions will get students' attention back. It just sort of is something to pay attention to. All of those little things add to um, kind of keeping their attention and then keeping them um, engaged. So, um, you should have more uh, on the, unless your screen is really big, then you won't have more. If you make your Zoom window smaller, you should get the more button. It, it, should, it should appear, yeah. All right, so that is um, microphone and sharing the screen. Um, actually, Marion, they would. So if a student was sharing a screen and they were gonna show a video, then they would have to click that also. Absolutely, yes. Whoever's sharing the screen at the time has to click those buttons. If they're gonna be sharing a video, yep, and they wanna do computer sound or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we talked about the microphone. We talked about sharing the screen. Let's go on to those intermediate options and nonverbal feedback icons, which is what you guys were just talking about. So let's look at that. We'll start with the um, nonverbal feedback in chat. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go right here. I brought my nice uh, participants panel over here. 
And this is what I want you to do. I want you to, um, there's too many people to open it up so you can see everybody, but I want you to keep your eyes on my nonverbal feedback icons here. Um, you'll notice you guys have a raise hand, okay? Probably don't choose that one, um, only because it puts you to the top and it doesn't really um, show you what I'm, I'm trying to show. I just want you to choose your favorite nonverbal feedback icon. You can choose any of these, yes, no, go slower, go faster. You can use the more button and you can do a thumbs down or a thumbs up, choose any of those. Now watch what happens as you guys do those. I have the little numbers up at the top here, you can see, to kind of show me a, a quick, uh, you know, a summary of what everybody is voting for. And so that helps me because maybe during the, maybe during class you could be like, you only have time for one more example and you don't know whether to do an example of, you know, topic A or topic B. You could easily say, if you want topic A, give me a green check. If you want topic B, give me a red X. And then people could vote. Even if you didn't have these numbers, you could scroll down through to see what everybody voted. But it's just so easy to have that, oh, you won't have that option, Claudette. You mean to see the totals? You'll only see that on mine. When you're the host of the meeting, you'll see it on yours. Unless there's something, unless you're talking about something else. The student would need to give you permission. Yep, and when I want to clear results, I have a clear all button right here. Ah, okay, I'll show you. So somebody's asking about annotations. Let me show you that. So, so anyway, so I can find these numbers up here. What I can do to make sure everybody has voted or kind of to check in and see how many people are with me, I can look at the number of participants up at the top and then I can add up these numbers to see if I'm kind of close to what that, to what the number at the top is, right? If you only have, you know, I don't know, um, a very few people have, no, you, only the host will have clear all. I'm sorry about that, I should have said that. Yeah, only the host will have clear all. If you wanna clear your own, you just click it again. So I'm gonna do a red X, and then to get rid of that red X, I go, I just do the red X again, and that turns it off for me. Only the host and co-host will have clear all to be able to clear those all out. Absolutely. Do you guys not have a raise hand here? Do you have a raise hand or no? Oh, so some people do. Okay, all right. You, so on the host, I don't have a raise hand because theoretically I'm not gonna raise my hand and ask my, myself a question. So I don't have the raised hand there. P participants usually have a raised hand here. Yeah, look at them all. <laughs> Here's the cool thing about the raised hand. Mindy was first to raise her hand. They keep them in order. So then whenever I ask Mind answer Mindy's question, I can click to lower her hand and then the next person pops up at the top. So I love the raised hand for that just because I can answer the questions in order. So that really helps. Or if I'm asking people to share feedback or something like that. So I love that a lot. All right. Um, any more questions about the nonverbal feedback icons? You can use those as a quick gauge of understanding, right? Like I did one time, I said, if everybody's good to go, give me a green um, check. If you have a question, give me a red X and type it in chat. So I can do it that way to just make sure. Maybe I'm solving a math problem and I wanna make sure that everybody writes down the problem before I start solving it. And so does everybody have the, the, um, the uh, the problem written down. I can have them give me a uh, green check and so forth. Ah, uh, there's no sounds that I know of. I bet there's some add-in that you could do that has sounds or something like that, but I don't think there's any sound. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good thought though. Okay, so anyway, watch this. I'm gonna clear these. So when I clear them, they just all disappear. Boom, gone. And so you can do that. And so that's a good thing to remember too. If you ask one question, sometimes I'll forget to clear them. They'll be there and I'll ask another question. So remember before you ask each question, clear them and then you get a fresh start, you can start again. 
All right, I'm gonna put this back over here. So that's a little bit about the participants panel and how you can use those nonverbal feedback icons. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, checking for understanding with chat and polls. Now, I actually have a poll for you guys to do for tonight. So I'm going to launch that in just a second. But first, I want to show you something. So what you can do with polls is you can ask a question. We love polls because we can have the students answer or the participants answer. You can actually go to your zoom.us account and download those results so that you can see you know how many people voted or whatever like that if you want to ah see that's a really okay so michelle asked a question when i show you how to create a poll in just a minute i'll show you that yeah you have to remind them so uh, the way Zoom has polls, you can ask more than one question at a time if you want to. So for me, I just have this one question on here. You'll see I have this little scroll bar, but it's just this one question. And so this is what it would look like on the participant side. So I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll. Yeah, polls are available in the free version. Yep. I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll that I had. And let me just show you how to do that. I'm going to bring my window back over here. and now I don't see my poll button, so no need to panic. I'm going to go more, and there's polls right there. So I'm going to click polls, and I only have one poll set up for this meeting, so here it is. If I had more than one poll, I would have a little drop down here, and I could click on it, and it would drop down and let me choose the other polls. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and put this over on this side. And I have my poll here. I know you can't, I know you're seeing my side of this poll. But once you open the poll, you're going to click launch poll. And that's what's going to give the poll to your students or whatever. So I'm going to click launch poll. And it should appear on your side. Now, when you vote, look up one second before well you don't have to you can look up or not but right here so you can see as people vote that these like pop around right i get these live totals as we go this might makes my math heart very happy to be able to see this live you know up and down how many percents and and all this stuff i can keep track right here it says 48 of 78 or 62 percent have voted I have a little uh, timer up here so I can give people a certain amount of time. Um, I don't know, um, uh, Michelle, I don't know if you're using them for quizzes, but we actually have had people use these for sort of in-class quizzes before. And so what you can do is you can launch a poll. You can keep track of how many people have submitted. Yep, perfect. You can keep track of how many people have submitted. And you can also say, okay, I wanna give them five minutes. You know, it might be a low stakes type thing. So it's not necessarily you want to, you know, it, it might not be like a hundred point quiz, like a really, you know, big quiz. It might be something you just use for participation to make sure they're there. You can choose to have the anonymous response or not, Kimberly. I'm actually going to show you that when I show you how to create one in just a second. So you can choose, uh, you can choose either way. All right, and so we have 59 of 78. I'm gonna go ahead and cut this off even though everybody hasn't voted just because I wanna move on and show you guys how to create one. So I'm gonna click end poll. And so you can see it sort of lights up the one that is in uh, the, the top vote getter in orange for me. Now you're seeing this on your side because I am showing it on my screen. If I move this, you shouldn't be seeing it. But I have a, a button here that says share results. So if I want to, I can actually share the results and then hopefully that popped up on your screen so you can see it too. So then I can say, you know, oh look, you know, most people are, you know, just enough to be dangerous, whatever. And so we can kind of talk about and debrief those results and things like that. Um, if you don't have an option, you probably don't have the option to do a poll right now. Um, on your side because you're not the host, so you can't launch a poll. But in a meeting where you had polling turn on and you have a poll created, you should get that. And I'll show, I'll show you that right now. So then from there, I can go stop results or, I mean, stop sharing, which should make it disappear from you, your side, 
or I could relaunch the poll. I'm just gonna say stop share and then I can close this. Now, just really quickly, I'm going to go to Zoom and show you how to create a poll. There we go. There we go, okay. My computer's a little slow today. I'm not sure what is, whoopsie, there we go. Okay. And so this is how you create a poll. I'm just gonna go to my, my regular Zoom account. Now, one thing is you can't create a poll until you create a meeting, okay? So you have to create the meeting first and then you can create a poll. Hmm, so it's waiting. Okay, there we go, close one. So I'm gonna sign in. There we go. And then I'll just choose one of the meetings. When you first sign into Zoom, you land on your meetings page. So that's not where I wanted to be signed into. One second, please. This always does this to me. It thinks it knows where I wanna go. Hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, it did work that time. Okay, good. All right. So it lands me on my meetings page. And so this is all my meetings listed here. I'm going to go to a meeting. Remember I said it has to already be created. So I'm going to go ahead and just choose any meeting. Um, I have a, uh, just a Zoom intro demo that looks as good as any. And so I've already created this. I'm gonna scroll down and at the bottom, you see I have the polls. And so I have, um, I have some polls I already created. I'm gonna go ahead and add a poll. And so this is where you would go. Create your meeting first, then go back and add a poll. So I'm gonna add. And then right here, I have, um, I can enter a title for the poll. The reason why this is important, if you don't enter a title, on your Zoom polling button, when you pull it up, it'll just say poll one, poll two, poll three. If you have more than one poll, you might not remember what those options were. So it's just a good idea to put um, a title so you'll know which one you're choosing. So I'm gonna say Zoom experience. Now this is my anonymous button, so I can choose whether it's anonymous or not. So if you, if you want it to be a quiz, of course you're not gonna choose anonymous. Um, students don't see a difference whether you say anonymous or not. So there's no difference on the student side. So uh, like I said, they won't know. So I'll just type my question in here. How experienced are you with Zoom? And then I can either do a single answer or I can do a multiple choice. Now it's not what you think. Like usually when we think about multiple choice, we think, okay, I give you some answers, you choose one. In this case, single choice means I give you some answers, you choose one. And multiple choice means I give you some answers, you select all that apply. If you're gonna make a mistake with a poll, you're gonna, that's gonna be it. The, the most common error is to choose the wrong type. So just be careful with that. Um, I'm gonna say not experienced, um, a little experienced, sort of, whoopsie, experienced or really experienced with Zoom. And then I'm just gonna go from here. Now, down here, this is what, I forget who it was, was it? I forget who it was, I apologize. I can add another question, okay, if I want to, to the exact same poll. So to add another question, I add it right here so that they would get two questions at the same time. If I want to add a question, but ask it in another place in my session, so maybe I wanna ask a question about Zoom, and then later on I wanna ask a question about, um, you know, different, like what discipline you teach or something like that. In that case, I would do two separate polls. I would save this one, and then I would go back and I would actually create another poll using add. 
Okay. And then Angela, do you mean about, about the part versus single choice versus multiple choice? Single choice means I give them options, they choose one. So they make a single choice. Multiple choice means I give them options, they choose all that apply. So maybe I wanna know what types of video conferencing tools you've used before. And so some people might have used, you know, Adobe and Zoom and Skype and, you know, several of them. So it's the difference between choose one or choose all that apply. Now, you can do up to 10 questions at a time. And you can do up to 25 polls. So theoretically, you could do 250 questions. Um, free response is not a possibility, but you know what you could do for that, Lance? A couple different things. Whenever we want a free response, what we usually do is we'll do the regular thing, and then if there's an other, we'll say, if there's an other, please type that in chat, so you could do it that way. Or you could have, um, you, instead of using a poll, you could do like a Google form or something like that. Actually, there is a way, and I just learned this. So I'm gonna see if this is a possibility. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to our, um, to our regular meeting. So I'm gonna go back to our PowerPoint, just really quickly, go there. I'm gonna drag this over here. Now, I, I was able to do this the other day, so it might have to do with which version of Zoom you are running. But let me click polls. Yeah, I don't have the drop down arrow here. The other day when I did it, I actually had a drop down here. And as long as I had one poll created, then I was able to create another poll on the fly. So that's something to check out in your own, um, in your own Zoom instance. But uh, one way you can get around that is like this. Create um, several, uh, I can think of two, but you might think of more than that, generic polls. So maybe do a generic true false and then a generic uh, multiple choice. And then you could put the question on a slide or you could just say the question out loud. You could put the question in chat, something like that. So it would be a way to be able to have a poll on the fly, but not really on the fly. I hope that makes sense. Sort of a way to trick it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. Let me go back to this. Let me see. Any question about polls? Give me a green check if you're good to go. Give me a red X if you have a question and type it in chat. Ah, Angela, you go to the um, Zoom web portal and you go the whole way to the bottom of Zoom, um, your uh, Zoom meetings. What you have to do, you have to go into a specific meeting and then the option is at the bottom. Okay, hang on, couple questions about polls. First of all, if you have multiple questions, yeah, let me just show you that again really quickly because um, I had another question about it anyway. Okay, just really quickly. So here I am on the Zoom portal. I land on my meetings tab. I choose the meeting that I want to add a poll to. So I'm gonna just choose any of my meetings. And then I scroll down and that's where you can add a poll, right there. So that's how you do that. If you have multiple questions in one poll, right, then they'll see them all at one time. So here's how it goes. If I create a poll and then I add a question within the same poll, then they'll see them all at the same time. If I want them to see them differently, separate times during the, during the um, class, I'll create a poll, so here's my one poll, and then I'll add a second poll, so a different poll at a different time. I hope that makes sense. Oh, no, I know what you're saying, Michelle. Michelle, I'll bet you any, I'll bet you any money it was because they were in, um, because of the view that they were in. So just really quickly, um, if you look at the top of your Zoom window, 
you should see you are viewing Leah Rosenberry's screen. Right beside you are viewing Leah Rosenberry's screen, you should have um, view options. Click on that button. And one of the options should be uh, like fit to window or full screen and things like that. I bet it was because of the way her screen was zoomed, it wouldn't let her, her scroll the whole way down. So have her change that zoom and I bet you any money she'll be able to see it. I, I sure hope that's it. I've had that problem before. Um, it's really rare, but when you do, it's crazy. You can change it to whatever you want. I like, let me see if I have, yeah, I don't have, I don't have that option whenever I'm doing it on mine. Um, I personally like fit to window. Yeah, I like fit to window um, because then it fits the whole thing. And then if I want to zoom in, I can zoom in and then I go back to fit to window. It just makes sure that I'm not losing anything. Yep, you got it. Oh my gosh, we're running out of time. Okay, really quickly. Um, and I will, I'll explain lock in just a second. Best practices for polls. You have to enable polling in your meeting settings or it's not going to, or you won't have the option to create polls. So that's, you just, you, it's not even a best practice. It's like a, you can't do it if you don't do this. So you have to. Uh, create them in advance. Another thing, it's not really a best practice. You sort of have to. <laughs> but, the, but this one is the best practice. Definitely test them before the session. Um, again, the most common mistake you're going to make is if you, by mistake, choose select one when you really mean select all or vice versa. So that's another thing. Um, to just kind of keep on your radar screen. Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, questioning uh, tools. So there's a couple different ways to use the questioning tools. You can use a poll for a knowledge check. If you want it to be a quiz, it can be a quiz, right? It can be a legit quiz if you wanted to make it that, um, I don't want to, I don't mean serious, but you know what I mean? If you, if you want it to be a quiz and kind of be more formal, it can totally do that. You can also just use it to just gather some data or kind of, you know, get some information from your students. Throw a slide up there, you know, at the beginning of every session that just kind of says, how are you doing? Because we're all going crazy during this time. And so, you know, it just gets people sort of loosened up for the rest of it. So you can do it that way with kind of a high stakes type thing. For as far as low stakes goes, you can do it with either chat, just kind of asking a question in chat, or you can do it with those nonverbal feedback icons. So those are just some things to kind of um, think about and sort of keep in your, uh, in your toolbox. The most important thing is, and this is going to sound completely crazy, you should be doing something every three minutes. Um, I know that sounds crazy and undoable, and it's like, are you kidding me? I, I wouldn't get anything else done if I was making them do something every three minutes. But if you sort of mix it up, you can have them do something every three minutes. You can have them, you know, put something in chat or have somebody, you know, um, um, you know, just vary your voice a little bit. Remember, all that stuff counts, right? You can say, um, one thing I used to say all the time would be, stop what you're doing. Stop, this is really important. I would actually say that whenever I was going to talk about something that I knew that there would be common mistakes or something like that. So that kind of thing. Um, and what else? I think that is about it. Yeah, um, I can, uh, I will go back. I know I love Kahoot. Kahoot, I love. Pull Everywhere is also fun, but Kahoot is like more fun and very fabulous. And um, anyway, it's just one of those things. Oh, Michelle. Michelle doesn't like Kahoot. I don't know what that means. Can't, I'm not sure what that, that <laughs> anyway, you should be able to manage your students and promote learning during virtual class meetings. You should be able to deal with some common tech issues, and I'll talk about that echo after if you want to. I forget who said it. Um, use Zoom tools to promote interaction and keep students engaged, and then also use best practices for screen sharing and chat and nonverbal feedback icons and polling. So thank you guys so much for coming. Again, if you would like to um, ask questions, I'll put my uh, email in here. I have a legit email, but I also just have leah at psu.edu. Feel free. Um, I love Google Docs and Google Forms for, you mean for asking questions and sort of polling type things? I love Google Docs so much. Oh, thank you, Becky, so much. Uh, talk to Danny about that. I don't know if there's spaces left available for next week or not. Um, 
we will. Uh... Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in here real quick. Perfect. Um, thank you. Any final questions, Professor Rosenberry, thank you so much. Um, we have not yet sent out the registration. Um, oh, sorry. Next week's sessions, we wanted to just keep them separate so nobody got confused about which meeting they were going to on which week. Um, so be on the lookout for those um, coming soon after we get through the Thursday session this week. Um, each of the sessions this week will be the same. And again, next week we'll offer Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, three opportunities to, to come and participate. Um, and, and that one is just as interactive or more. Um, got to do that with Professor Rosenberry yesterday. So that was a lot of fun. Um, we recorded this. We'll be sending out the recording. If you have questions for us at Hawks Learning, you can reach us at marketing at hawkslearning.com. Um, we'll host this up on our blog. So thanks again for coming. Thank you for participating. And um, Professor Rosenberry, I'll turn it back over to you for any final questions and goodbyes. Sounds great. So um, somebody's asking about an echo. So let me tell you just a quick thing about echoes if you ever have an echo. If, is it your own echo or is it an echo that the students are complaining about? Thanks everybody, if you have to pop out. Okay, both. Okay, so here's some, here's some tips about an echo. If you are getting your own echo, uh, check your, and make sure that you only have one sound uh, like speakers and microphone turned on. So for example, sometimes I will be signed in on two computers because I use one computer to present and then the other computer to kind of watch and make sure what it looks like and it, that it's coming through okay. Just make sure that you have one completely muted or, you know, don't even connect the audio on one. And then the other one can be ready to go. That works. The other thing too is, and this is, if you don't have a headset, this really helps, is just wearing a headset. Because I don't have the sound out loud for my computer to kind of pick back up again. So that should really help. Um, the other thing is if you do have a headset, Gotcha. If you do have a headset, the other thing you can do is sometimes you just need to turn the sound down in your headset because sometimes the headset is just enough to kind of cause that feedback loop. It's like the, the sound coming out of your ear, whatever these are called, feeds back into the microphone just a little bit. And so that sometimes uh, causes that issue. Ah, I'll tell you what about annotation. You cannot see annotation if the host has it turned off. So let me show you this. Um, under the security button, um, this is where you can kind of do some quick troubleshooting if you have a problem with a student or, you know, just something like that. It doesn't even have to be anything malicious. They just might be like, you know, it's just fun to write on screens and stuff like that. If you click this security button, I have lots of options. And I saw somebody ask me about lock meeting too, so I'm glad I popped this up. I have lots of options for, for, for taking care of things on the fly with, um, within my meeting. So um, I have annotation turned off. So if you try to find your annotation button, you won't find it. Now I'm going to turn it right back on right now, and you should see it. I'm going to turn it on. And so now, under you are viewing Leah Rosenberry screen, and then right beside that is view options. Under there, you should see annotation. And I see somebody found it because you're writing on my screen. Listen, it's fun to write on the screen, so feel free if you want to write on there. Um, so there's that. So that's, that's for annotations. The other things I can turn on and off. I can turn it off so that participants can't share their screen unless I want them to, right? So I can, I can decide that. I can turn off chat if I want to. So if, I, if I'm concerned <laughs> about, about things going on in the background or something like that, I can even turn off the chat. I can let people rename themselves or not. I can let people unmute themselves or not, and then the same thing. Now, just really quickly, the difference between lock meeting and enable a waiting room. If you lock your meeting, anybody who is not in will not be able to get in, and you won't know they're trying to get in, okay? So lock meeting is kind of a done deal. I would only use lock meeting for something like a hiring committee 
or some sort of disciplinary action or some, some type of thing that just needs to be completely locked down. You know exactly who's supposed to be there. You can make sure everybody's there and then you can lock it. So you could do it that way. The other thing you can do is enable the waiting room. I love the waiting room. The waiting room just gives like an intermediate place for people to be before you let them in. And so um, that way, if there's somebody that you don't want to let in, you know, whatever, if you're checking to see it's just make sure it's just your students or just people from your committee or whatever it is, you can use the waiting room. And then if there's somebody that shouldn't be there, you just don't let that person in. That's exactly the thing. Janet, Janet said, what if somebody got kicked out and then they couldn't get back in? If you lock it, you would have to unlock it or they would not be able to get back in. Absolutely. So great question. That's another reason why I prefer enable waiting room over lock meeting. But again, like I said, it depends on what the, what the purpose is. All right. Did I miss any? What else? The cool thing about the annotations, just while I have you here, I'm going to show you my annotate button or my toolbar right here. So what you can do is you can have students write all over the screen. You can create some sort of shared artifact or something like that. I can click this share button and then I can click show in folder. And when I do that, it'll bring that folder right up so that then I'm able to get that and I could share it with students if I wanted to or whatever. I'll just show you what it looks like. So there it is, whoopsie, lost it. Okay, I'm pretty sure I got hung up, but it'll, it'll come back. Ah, the enable waiting room does not have a ding, but you can make it have a ding if you want to. So there's another thing called um, enable sound whenever people are joining your meeting. And in that case, you can turn that on. I love that one in case I am teaching or something like that. Um, let me see where that is and I'll show that to you. I think that is on the participants panel. Let me see. There we go. Yeah, so play sound when someone joins or leaves meeting. And so you can do that. There's actually a setting in your Zoom settings that you can do it so it only plays for you. So that way you're not driving all your participants crazy. I love it because of that. So something to keep in mind there. It's muted, yeah. Anything else? Here, I could clear that off for you. Go clear. So you can clear your own drawings. You can clear just the viewer's drawings or you can clear all drawings. So I can clear drawings. And then if I want everybody to be done, like I said, I can go like this. I can go um, security button and I can turn off those annotations. And then you guys will lose your, your um, students will lose their annotation um, button or whatever. Ah, Dina, excellent question. Um, I can actually go to zoom.us and get that information. And since I'm already there, I can do it really quickly uh, for one. So I can go to Zoom and I can go to reports right here. This is the same place I get poll reports. So I'm gonna click that. And so you can see I have usage report. If I click usage, I can choose my dates. Let me put a date in here that's earlier. There we go. I don't know if I'll have any because this is my um, my other account. That's a, oh, there it is. Okay, so here are some different usage reports. So I can go um, to any report, any uh, meeting that I want to see. I can click the button here and then I can see who was there. I can see what time they came, what time they left, how long they stayed and things like that. So that's that's the, if I care, if if it's attendance that I'm after, I could do that. The other thing I can do is under reports again. Now this one's not gonna have any results, but under meeting, I can do poll reports. I don't think I have any polls on this, on this account, but I can click right here and do a poll report. I don't think I have any polls in here, I apologize. Oh, well, I'm just testing. That, that works though. And so I find which one I wanna test. I'm gonna go generate. And it'll make me a nice little thing I can download. And 
and then I can get the poll results from there. For whatever reason, these do take a long time to open up. It's like Zoom does, or I'm sorry, uh, at least Windows. Windows doesn't um, um, recognize it as a legit CSV or something like that. Oh, great. Uh, so Janet asked a question about she had about six pages of a report for 20 students because they kept getting kicked out. There's an option at the top of where the report of the thing is that says um, if you click it, right, you can choose to, uh, they'll, they'll combine all those times they got kicked out into one person. I forget what the, what the exact language is, but it'll combine it so it's just one person. It'll combine all their sign-ins. I don't know how long they're saved. It depends on your institution. At Penn State, it's six months. Um, I don't know why that would be, Mindy. I'm sorry. I, I would be glad to try and troubleshoot that with you. I don't know why that would be. I always get an attendance report. Do you require people to sign in or... Are they just using a link or do you know how they're getting in? Oh, if they're getting, it's, it has to be there somewhere. It has to be there somewhere. Anyway, just really quickly, this is just like a, 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 a test I did on my own, but I did a little test to see whether polls were anonymous, anonymous or not. And so this is, what it, this is what it looked like. And so there, these are the people that answered the poll, email, date and time submitted, what the question was, what the answer was. And so you can do that. So if you do some quizzes, you can download them just like this and, and, and go from there. It should not be based on license. Um, license, the only difference as far as I know, and again, it I'm sure it would be different for each, uh, each uh, school or whatever. Um, the, the difference between a free account and a, a sort of like an education account, the only thing that should be is 40 minute meetings and cloud storage. The rest of it should be pretty much the same. So I'm not sure. Yep, you can get the recording. If you record it to the cloud, you can do that and, and post it so students can view it, absolutely. Ah, so let me show you where recordings are and it just depends on, on what your thing is. And let's let this be the last question because I'm guessing that Danny has to have a life, right Danny? <laughs> <laughs> so under uh, recordings, right here, and so these are all my recordings, and so I can click right here if I want to, and I can, um, I can download it if I want to, or I can do something called copy shareable link. So I, if I copy it, then I can just share the link that way and go from there. Um, virtual backgrounds, we don't really cover next week either. Um, email me and I'll send you something. So virtual backgrounds just let you have a background so that it's not showing what your, what your house behind you looks like. Um, so here's my video. And I don't know if it's going to let me actually because I'm on my, um, I'm on my, I'm not on my fast computer, so I'm going to choose it anyway, just to just to make sure. So I'm choosing virtual background, and I'm going to do the Empire State Building. I'm see if it's going to let me do this. It's making me download something because I don't have a. Um, green screen. It's thinking. But anyway, just to, just to show you. So right on your on your video button, you're going to choose choose virtual background. Oh, there I go. So there I am. So they've made an improvement. So there's my virtual background. Here's my Nittany line if I want to use that. Here's my old main. Um, I thought I was at the beach. I guess it's not catching up with me. No problem. No, once you set the virtual background, it will stick until you change it the next time. Uh, it depends on your school. 
how long the recordings are saved. We move ours to box um, or, uh, or we just put it right in Canvas, so. All right, thank you everybody. If you have questions, feel free to email me, like I said, and then, you know, hope to see you next week. That would be great. I understand why that's not sent out <laughs> right away. I wasn't thinking about that, Danny. Sorry about that, um, but that would be great. No problem. Thanks again. Hope everyone has a great night. Bye, everybody. Thank you.